ಸಂಬುಧಸ್ಸ ಗಚಾಮಿ ಸಂಘಂಗಿ ಸಂಘಿ ಸುರಾಮೇರಮಣಿ When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down at one side and asked the Blessed One. Master Gautama, what is the cause and condition 
why human beings are seen to be inferior and superior, for people are seen to be short-lived and long-lived, sickly and healthy, ugly and beautiful, uninfluential and influential, poor and wealthy, low-born and high-born, stupid and wise. What is the cause condition, Master Gotama? Why human beings are seen to be inferior and superior? Student, being a horn of their action, hair of their action. They originate from their action, are bound to their action, have their action as the refuge. It is action that dis- distinguishes being as inferior and superior. I do not understand in detail the meaning of Master Gotama's statement, which is speaking brief without expounding the meaning in detail. It will be good if Master Gotama will teach me the Dhamma, so that I might understand in detail the, the meaning of Master Gotama's statement. Then, student, listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, sir, the Brahmin student Suba replied, the Blessed One say this. According to MN, his father, the Brahmin Todeya, was reborn as a dog in his own house because of his extreme stinginess. The Buddha identified him to Suba by getting the dog to dig up some hidden treasure Suba's father had birthed before his death. This inspired Suba's confidence in Buddha and moved him to approach and inquire about the working of Kama. Uh, just a, sh- a brief note. Um, stupid is probably not the best translation of here of that word. Uh, it's literally unwise. Wise and unwise. I mean, the effect is the same, but it's odd that he chose a word. It's a little more polite, I suppose. Wise and unwise. Dear student, some man or woman kills living beings and is murderous, bloody-handed, given to blows and violence, merciless to living beings. Because of pe- performing and undertaking such action on the dissolution of the body after death, he re- reappears in a state of deprivation, in an unhappy destination, in perdition, even in hell. But if on this, the dissolution of the body, after death, he does not reappear in a state of deprivation, in an unhappy destination, in perdition, in hell, but instead comes back to the human state, then wherever he is reborn, he is short-lived. Note 12.24 if the kama of killing directly determines the mode of rebirth, it will produce rebirth in one of the states of deprivation. But if a wholesome kama brings about a human rebirth, and rebirth as a human being is always the result of wholesome kama, the kama of killing will operate in a manner of, in a manner contrary to to that of the rebirth generative kama by causing various adversities that may eventuate in a premature death. The same principle holds for the subsequent cases in which unwholesome karma comes to maturity in a human existence. In each case the unwholesome karma counteracts the wholesome karma responsible for the human rebirth by engendering a specific type of misfortune corresponding to its own distinctive quality. End of the note. This is the way, student, that leads to short life. Namely, one kills living beings and is murderous, bloody-handed, given to blows and violence, merciless to living beings. And this sutta is sort of a prime example for taking things too literally. You'll notice um, it is often the case where a teaching is taken too literally or too, yeah, literally, I guess, where it sounds like the Buddha is saying something must be a certain way and then it's taken up as a view that it is always that way. So in this case, it would be something like someone who kills has only two possibilities to them. But even that is it shows the complications that not necessarily true that even a murderer is going to go to hell. They can still be born as a human. It's also not necessarily true that they will experience 
any uh, meaningful suffering as a result. There, it's complicated. What we what we can say is that there the results of unwholesomeness are always unpleasant if they give results, but it's not really the case that they would give no results, but the results may not be so extreme depending on other conditions and complexities. So just to keep in mind that these are really only guidelines and they're incredibly over oversimplistic, which doesn't negate the value of the teaching. It's in one of them more well-known suttas, and it's quite valuable to think of these as sort of guidelines, but that's all they are. You could never get to the depth of the nature of karma with such uh, simplistic or simple teachings. Nonetheless, this is the kind of sutta that people look for, try and understand the correlation between our actions and our future rebirths. Isn't this, though, generally true, though, that, for example, the for cleaning a living being, is generally the result. Yeah, generally, of course. That's the whole point. Is you don't don't miss the word generally and say this is what happens. This is what generally happens yes. or usually happens. Okay, thank you. Six. But here, student, some man or woman abandoning the killing of living beings abstains from li killing living beings with rod and weapon laid aside. Gentle and kindly, he abides compassionate to all living beings because of performing and undertaking such action. On the dissolution of the body, after death, he reappears in a happy destination, even in the heavenly world. But if on the dissolution of the body, after death, he does not appear in a happy destination in the heavenly world, but instead comes back, to the human state, then wherever he is reborn, he is long lived. Note 12.25 In this case, the wholesome karma of abstaining from killing may be di directly responsible for either the heavenly rebirth or the longevity in a human existence. The same principle applies in all the past messages on the maturation of wholesome karma. This is the way, student, that leads to long life, namely abandoning the killing of living beings. One abstains from killing living beings with rod and weapon laid aside. Gentle and kindly, one abides compassionate to all living beings. Here, student, some man or woman is given to injuring beings with the hand, with a clod, with a stick, or with a knife. Because of performing and undertaking such action, on the dissolution of the body after death, he reappears in a state of deprivation, etc. But if instead he comes back to the human state, then wherever he is reborn, he is sickly. This is the way, student, that leads to sickliness. Namely, one is given to injuring beings with the hand, with a clod, with a stick, or with a knife. The, uh, the commentary goes into some detail or, or mentions at least the uh, four types of karma, or one set of the four types of karma is that which is uh, generative like karma that in and of itself will produce results. Or rather than thinking of it like that, you can think of it as the effect of karma to give results. That's just how we ordinarily think of it. But there are other effects of karma, of ethical act or ethical mind states, really, ethical, unethical mind states. The second is it can prevent another karma from giving result. This is the upakataka karma. It destroys the effect of other karmas. The third type is it supports or augments another karma. So it can if another karma wasn't wasn't able to or the results were not going to be significant, it makes them significant as a as a catalyst, as a support. So sometimes your reputation precedes you and so on. And so your deeds are taken with greater magnitude, that sort of thing. I mean, it's it's really just a simple way of describing 
what we can observe in reality or or pointing out that this is happening on a detailed level and really showing how important the minutia are the everyday moments of our life are so incredibly important because they change the trajectory of our future constantly doing this nudging us in different directions so the third is supportive and the fourth is I don't know what you'd say like unsupportive the taking away from the power of other karma or uh, not preventing it but making it weaker mitigating so there's a complexity to it that causes complex results because we're not entirely good and not entirely evil and we have many different commas of many different kinds that change us in many different ways Bante, can we say in case of, for example, killing is more a more serious act than, let's say, lying? Well, neither of the acts are serious, so you have to go deeper and yeah. you have to remember that you're talking about Abhidhamma if you want to understand this. For example, say you kill a mosquito, okay? And let's say you are lying about the Buddha, that he did something horrible, which is a lie just to... Uh, throw mud at someone who is very holy compared to those two. But it's not still not really very useful because neither one is meaningful. It's the mind states behind it. Remember, when yeah, we talk that's... about karma in Buddhism, we're actually not talking about the acts. So again, the Buddha is using something very simplistic or simple here that glosses over the actual truth, the actual reality, and you can't uh, forget that. That none of this is actually on a deeper sense meaningful. This teaching that the Buddha is giving is to a Brahmin, someone who has the idea that there are certain acts that are potent and the acts themselves are potent and they don't have anything to do with ethics. It has to do with ritual and that was their idea of karma. And the Buddha said, well, you know, the real teaching on karma is the ethics of it, which is based on mind states, but he just doesn't go into that with someone as deluded as Todeya. It's exactly why I'm asking this question, having in mind the mind states that are actually the potent reason for karma. So is it important, the action itself? I mean, it can be. I mean, it's certainly going to trigger different mind states. It's hard to avoid some pretty serious ones with things like killing. I think you could argue that stealing is generally less likely to be as extreme as killing i mean there's mm -hmm. there's no um garukama that's associated with stealing like it's impossible to get it to be that extreme killing is generally mm -hmm. more but yeah generally pretty bad you notice he doesn't mention stealing here like if someone steals i don't think does he covetous no jealous envious envy can consume you Envy is pretty, envy is worse than greed, right? Envy is, is generally uh, just perverse and poisonous. It can consume you and it's twisted and cruel and that sort of thing. As opposed to just greed, which can be relatively benign. I mean, every being that is reborn is reborn because of greed right? yeah, of some sort. Example I was going to talk about was uh, Chinchi Monica. I think she's the one accused the Buddha of having a child. I think she went to hell directly after that. If you compare that to somebody less killing a mosquito. Lying uh, is considered therapy. to be pretty serious, especially because of how related it is to truth and how important truth is. But uh, there is the difference, right, when you lie because uh, of hate, so your mind state is in a, or the reason is uh, that you're lying is uh, because of hate or or loba greed. Yeah, well, I don't know that there's that that changes the the magnitude so much. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there's there's other factors. There's going to be like wrong view and just the magnitude of one's defilements. Hate is said to be like very destructive but short-lived. Uh, greed, not very destructive, but it is the effects can be seen in long term. Delusion or ignorance is both severe and long-term effects. Delawar, you wanted to ask a question. Sorry about interrupting you constantly. That's okay. Thank you. Um, Bhante, 
uh, couldn't uh, lying be potentially more dangerous for the victim as uh, killing if if it uh, let's say it dies with a pure mind but uh, if it believes yeah. the, the lie right, then yeah. it could be very dangerous depending on the lie for sure mm. but yeah lying is given a prominent place as a prominent sort of evil because of the distortion how it prevents one it denies one access to reality access to the truth if if one believes the lie it, it puts them in dissonance with truth with reality which is dangerous I mean, of course there's going to be magnitudes it's not that significant if you lie to someone and try to trick them for example like friends and and oh do you play a prank on someone or lying to someone about their weight or about their haircut or it's not going to be all that significant in the long term but of course it's still unwholesome if i remember right lying is the one uh, lying is the single precept the bodhisattva didn't break uh, throughout his uh, cultivation of paramita in sansara that's why the buddha's word is really powerful i think there's a teaching if, if one lies there's no evil they won't commit Aurora, do you want to ask a question? I did, because we're talking about lying, and I, I realized about what you're saying is that there's absolutely no way to predict what will happen. It's just too complicated, but what's the likely outcome in the future life of someone who lies a lot? Hmm. There's something about, well, it's a silly thing, but I think that has to do with bad breath. Is that the one that has mm -hmm. to do with bad breath? Right. You're, you're not taking seriously. People don't trust you. Crooked uh, teeth, I, bad breath. I would say, yeah, I would say that, yeah, the crookedness of mind. Your, your mind will, in, in future lives, your mind will be mixed up, confused. Thank you. But what if somebody lies about spiritual things like Nibbana or Jhana? I think it's more serious, right? Yeah. If a monk does that, they're no longer a monk. Paragraph 8. But here, student, some man or woman is not given to injuring beings with the hand, with a clod, with a stick, or with a knife. Because of performing and undertaking such action on the dissolution of the body, after death he appears, he reappears in a happy destination. But if instead he comes back to the human state, then whenever he is reborn, he is healthy. This is the way, student, that leads to health. Namely, one is not given to injuring beings with the hand, with a clod, with a stick, or with a knife. Here, student, some man or woman is of an angry and irritable character. Even when criticized a little, he is offended, becomes angry, hostile, and resentful, and displays anger, hate, and bitterness. Because of performing and undertaking such action, he reappears in a state of deprivation. But if instead he comes back to the human state, then whenever he is reborn, he is ugly. This is the way student that leads to ugliness. Namely, one is of an angry and irritable character and displays anger, hate and bitterness. But here, student, some man or woman is not of an angry and irritable character. Even when criticized a lot, he is not offended, he does not become angry, hostile and resentful, and does not display anger, hate and bitterness. Because of performing and undertaking such action, he reappears in a happy destination. But if instead he comes back to the human state, then Wherever he is reborn, he is beautiful. This is the way, student, that leads to being beautiful. Namely, one is not an angry and irritable character that does not display anger, hate, and bitterness. Here, student, some man or woman is envious, one who envies, resents, and begrudges the gains, honors, respect, to reverence, salutations, and veneration received by others. Because of performing and undertaking such actions, he reappears in a state of deprivation. But if instead he comes back to the human state, 
effect, then whenever he is reborn, he is uninfluential. This is the way student that leads to being uninfluential, namely one is envious toward the gains, honor, respect, reverence, salutation, and veneration received by others. But here, student, some man or woman is not envious. One who does not envy, resent, and begrudge the gains, honor, respect, reverence, salutations, and veneration received by others. Because of performing and undertaking such, such action, he reappears in a happy destination. But if instead he comes back to the human state, then whenever he is reborn, he is influential. This is the way, student, that leads to being influential, namely, one is not envious towards the gains, honor, respect, reverence, salutations, and veneration received by others. Here, student, some man or woman does not give food, drink, clothing, carriages, garlands, scents, unguents, beds, dwelling, and lumps to recluses and brahmins, Because of performing and undertaking such action, he reappears in a state of deprivation. But if instead he comes back to the human state, then whenever he is reborn, he is poor. This is the way, student, that leads to poverty, namely, one does not give food, etc., and lamps to recluses or brahmins. But here, student, some man or woman gives food, etc., and lamps to recluses or Brahmins. Because of performing and undertaking such action, etc., he reappears in a happy destination. But if instant he comes back to the human state, then wherever he is reborn, he is wealthy. This is the way, student, that leads to wealth, namely one gives food, etc., and lamps to recluses and Brahmins. Here, student, some man or woman is obstinate and arrogant. He does not pay homage to one who should receive homage, does not rise up for one in whose presence he should rise up, does not offer a seat to one who deserves a seat, does not make way for one for whom he should make way, and does not honor, respect, revere, and venerate one who should be honored, respected, revered, and venerated. Because of performing and undertaking such action, he reappears in a state of deprivation. But if instead he comes back to the human state, then wherever he is reborn, he is low-born. This is the way, student, that leads to low birth, namely, one is obstinate and arrogant, and does not honor, respect, revere, and venerate one who should be honored, respected, revered, and venerated. I have a question. Uh, what is low-born, Bhante? Well, it would make more sense in India where there were actual stratifications of the social system, but in most societies there's some sort of stratification. It means low class, born into a family that has no name, no claim to prestige or renown or honor. Like I grew up in a small town and there were certain families who had, who were honored and yeah, they had, you know, there, there was an extended family that was well known and well received. And then there were families that were outcast for whatever reason or you know, seen as lower, lower class born into a family of uh, dishonor. Even in UK, you can be born as a lord or born into a family of a lord or right. some. That's simple a good example. Simple term. Thank you, Valde. <clears throat> but here, student, some man or woman is not obstinate and arrogant. He pays homage to one who should receive homage, rises up for one, in in whose presence he should rise up, offers a seat to one who deserves a seat, makes a way for one for whom he should make way, and honors, respects, reveres, and venerates one who should be honored, respected, revered, and venerated. 
Because of performing and undertaking such action, he reappears in a happy destination. But if instead he comes back to the human state, then whenever he is reborn, he is highborn. This is the way, student, that leads, leads to high birth, namely one is not obstinate and arrogant, and honors, respects, reveres, and venerates one who should be honored, respected, revered, and venerated. Here, student, some man or woman does not visit a recluse or a Brahmin and ask, Venerable sir, what is wholesome? What is unwholesome? What is blamable? What is blameless? What should be cultivated? What should not be cultivated? What kind of action will lead to my harm and suffering for a long time? What kind of action will lead to my welfare and happiness for a long time? Because of per performing and undertaking such action, he reappears in a state of deprivation. But if instead he comes back to the human state, then wherever he is reborn, he is stupid. This is the way, student, that leads to stupidity. Namely, one does not visit a recluse or Brahmin and ask such questions. But here, student, some man or woman visits a recluse or a Brahmin and asks, Venerable Sir, what is wholesome? What kind of action will lead to my welfare and happiness for a long time? Because of performing and undertaking such action, he reappears in a happy destination. But if instead he comes back to the human state, then wherever he is reborn, he is wise. This is the way, student, that leads to wisdom. Namely, one visits a recluse or Brahmin and asks such questions. And the Pali is Dupanya and Mahapanya. It's not even wise, it's it, of great wisdom and of little wisdom. Upanya, Mahapanya. The students, the way that leads to a short life makes people short lived. The way that leads to long life makes people long lived. The way that leads to sickliness makes people sickly. The way that leads to health makes people healthy. The way that leads to ugliness makes people ugly. The way that leads to beauty makes people beautiful. The way that leads to being uninfluential makes people uninfluential. The way that leads to being influential makes people influential. The way that leads to poverty makes people poor. The way that leads to wealth makes people wealthy. The way that leads to low birth makes people low born. The way that leads to high birth makes people high born. The way that leads to stupidity makes people stupid. The way that leads to wisdom makes people wise. Question about lowborn. It might help if you understand the actual word isn't lowborn or highborn. It's of low family or high family. So it does actually refer to your. I mean, the mm -hmm. lineage is the idea, but it's basically what family you're born into or what lineage, what your station is in life. Nichakulina, uchakulina. That can also mean, right, that, uh, I don't know, the parents are educated or not educated, things like that? Yeah, I don't think that's quite the, the idea is more their station in society. Like what, and it's, it's not so much about your parents, it's about what you will become, like how kids are teased in school because of who their parents are, or mm -hmm. looked down upon or, or looked up upon, up towards. Based on okay. family, based on your station. It can be the color of the skin in certain societies. If you're born with a darker skin, usually you know, that many societies look down upon that and they have these prejudices, that sort of thing. I mean, that's more complicated because, of course, the prejudice is the real evil, but it still puts you at a loss. Also, if you're born with maybe light skin in a society with favors dark skin or is mostly dark skin being uh, 
Uh, it's complicated, but th that kind of thing plays a part because it ostracizes you and sets you as different and therefore usually inferior. If you're born into an immigrant family, it's often harder because you don't feel like you fit into the society and you're treated with disrespect and racism and that sort of thing. Just say low, a low family or high family in India because everybody knew what that meant because there was a clear, fairly clear stratification and it was perpetuated this idea that certain rebirths were, certain births were preferred. Like if you're born into a Brahmin family, that make, that just makes you higher just by its very nature. And it wasn't true, but it, it's a self-perpetuating uh, idea because it makes itself true. When you tell everybody that, then suddenly it, well, it becomes real because you're treated with preference by the people. And so it's not uh, it's not that there's some val validity to the idea of stratification of society. It's that you end up being at the butt end of these uh, systems due to your bad karma. You get put in a position where you're at the receiving end of such mistreatment or treatment, pre preferential treatment in the case of good karma. Also, the results of karma depends on the time period. I think it's called Kala Sapa. So if it is a very good time period, uh, the people uh, are not racist and people uh, respect each other, then the karma, even bad karma, doesn't get a chance to uh, come into fruition. But if life in this world is suffering, then why is it a reward to have a long life? I mean, the Buddha never said life is suffering. I know. I know he never said it. I said it. I mean, he said the five aggregates are suffering. Well, they're, they're dukkha, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're suffering. It's probably not the best translation to say they're suffering. Dukkha means they can't make you happy. They can't bring happiness. They can't bring satisfaction. I mean, it's complicated. You can't just say life is suffering. I said life in this world. I didn't say life. Well, life in any world. You can't say it's suffering. It's just not very accurate. It's just the result of good karma. Like uh, you yeah. experiencing something pleasant is, uh, even though it comes under the noble truth of suffering, it doesn't mean that pleasantness is not something beneficial to you compared to something horrible. I think the confusion comes when you just always translate dukkha as, as suffering, and that's not accurate. Dukkha is the opposite of sukha. So in many cases, when the Buddha uses the word dukkha, he's just using it to negate the possibility of sukha. That and and sukha has to be understood with complexity as well. That it doesn't always just mean happiness. It it doesn't always just mean the pleasure. Right. Sometimes it refers to pleasure, but sometimes it refers more specifically or more with greater depth to actual contentment or satisfaction it has to be understood philosophically. And dukkha as well has to be understood philosophically. Like philosophically, pleasure isn't happiness, even though you can't really argue with the fact that pleasure is happiness. I mean, literally, it's just that philosophically, it's not. It's not of any value or purpose. And philosophically, suffering is that which keeps you bound to samsara or that which can't make you happy that which isn't satisfying and another aspect is it isn't meaningful or beneficial or it isn't of any significance or value the buddha said that about existence he said it's of no meaning or significance value yeah and another example is let's say you are born deaf blind you are going to be crippled, like uh, you, you, you can't even study, uh, learn the Dhamma. So that is being born with a healthy body, complete uh, with uh, working faculties, is uh, much more beneficial than being born crippled or deaf or slow. Yeah, goodness is not something to be trifled with or discarded or discounted. But there is a good point to the question of, of why bother, right? Why should why should any of this really impact our our course? And it really shouldn't to any great degree. It's not even so much. You notice that the Buddha isn't really here saying 
which is better, right? He isn't saying uh, you should do this because it makes you live a long life. Much more important and much more the reason for giving this sort of teaching is to point out the mechanics and the limitations of all of our machinations. Whenever we have ambitions or desires, you could look at this and say, oh, well, then I should just work really hard for the good things then you're missing the point because the point is you'll always be susceptible to the bad things as long as you have the potential to give rise to them. There's nothing wrong with, of course, doing good deeds. It's a, it's a, it's a good idea to do, but it's not enough to prevent you. I mean, it's not getting to the point that the reason why you're able to do good deeds in the first place is because you have good states of mind, you have positive qualities, and much more important is to keep to work on getting rid of the bad qualities. Then all you've got left is good qualities and all left is good deeds. So it's not so much that good deeds are useless or meaningless, but our purity of mind is the most important thing because it's what allows us to do good deeds in the first place. Also, this uh, sutta provides an answer to people who just... Uh... Uh, keep complaining, why me? Why this happened to me? Why I'm born this way? Like, yeah, it provides this uh, basic understanding of the mechanics, introduces people to cause and effect. I mean, it can be quite eye opening for people who thought that it was random or maybe that it's God doing it or something. To think that all of the rules of cause and effect that we apply in normal life really do apply to. What we might call spiritual life, or or just uh, on, a, on a broader level, like they really are everything, or you know they they are, they they play a part in everything. They play a part in rebirth. Twenty beings are owners of their actions. Student, heirs of their actions. They originate from their actions. Are bound to their bound to their actions. Have their actions as their refuge. It is action that distinguishes beings as inferior and superior. When this was said, the Brahmin student, Subha, Todeya's son, said to the Blessed One, Magnificent Go Master Gautama, Magnificent Master Gautama, Master Gautama has made the Dhamma clear in many ways as though he were, he were turning upright what had been overturned, revealing what was hidden showing the way to one who was lost or holding up a lamp in the dark for those with eyesight to see forms. I go to Master Gautama for refuge and to the Dhamma and to the Sangha of Bhikkhus. Let Master Gautama remember me as a lay follower who has gone to him for refuge for life. I wanted to ask Bhante about, is it the, just the Buddha who actually could say what causes what? Like who could uh, actually describe how karma works? Or was it that also in the... Prior to him, uh, I don't know what religion existed before that. I, I wouldn't understand. So prior, prior to, so is it also uh, describing karma, cause and effect like this, like uh, even to the extent of beautiful and ugly and poor and wealthy, um, is this also only described by the Buddha? Or, or only specific to Buddhism? Well, uh, only the Buddha can know it uh, accurately. Others can have some sense of it. It's, uh, the workings of karma, I think, are uh, uh, one of the four unthinkables. Things you'll go mad, you'll go crazy if you try to understand them. Yeah. But uh, I remember there were like ritualistic uh, behaviors to um, behaving like a bull or a dog or something. I guess people didn't really understand at all cause and effects prior to the Buddha. 
Well, yeah, the Buddha came into the time of the Brahmin, and the Brahmins had their own, they used this word karma. They were the ones who started using karma in a religious sense, this word, which really just means action, right? In ordinary parlance, it would be used to speak of action that you did when you work. It would call, be called your karma, your karma. When you, uh, I mean, just anything you did, what did he do, you know? King, Karo, King Karosi, what did he do? Kar is the root. It's a very basic root, like in English, act or do, make. It covers all of those things. Uh, but the Brahmins started using it to refer to important actions. So they would say, there's something to this action, a ritual. They started using it to mean ritual. You would do a ritual, form a ritual. And that was, uh, the, why would you do it? Because there's some uh, something to the karma, something to that act. And so they gave it significance. So it became a real religious thing and you know, nothing to do with ethics. It was just that these were good karmas, these rituals of uh, sacrificing animals or sacrificing uh, fire sacrifice where you pour butter into a, a flame and that sort of thing. So that's why there's so much talk about karma, really, is it was a part of the refutation or the realignment, setting people straight in that time when karma was uh, an important Brahmanic religious, religious teaching from the Vedas. Thank you. So uh, uh, even Arahants can also see, uh, but not as clear as the Buddha. So if you have the divine eye faculty, one of the things and one of the powers under the divine eye faculty is called uh, Yata Kamupaka Satta Pajanat. It's uh, knowing uh, being arise, beings arising according to their good and bad actions. person with uh, this uh, divine eye faculty can get an idea what uh, somebody has done in the past to suffer. Life, but not as uh, clear as the Buddha. So Bhante mentioned, you mentioned um, <clears throat> that uh, Sutta were uh, like the, it's part of the four un unthinkable um, topics, right? The thinking about uh, karma, because it's so complicated that uh, one can go mad uh, if, if they want to understand it uh, through intellectual uh, thinking, right? But it is, uh, it is possible, as uh, Sankha is mentioning, to um, experience it, right? To understand it uh, through practice or through, I don't know, wisdom growth. Yeah, through, uh, if you attain the jhanas and then develop abhinya powers, uh, you can look into the past of a certain being or your own past and see what uh, you uh, committed to experience some something in the present moment. But uh, so the it doesn't mean you can see all the workings of karma. You might see the like a root cause yeah. of it or something like that. Mm. Was the Brahmin student Suba so impressed because the Buddha talked about karma in a non-ritualistic context? He was initially impressed. If you read the note one, two, two, three, the Buddha, I think, visited his house and the dog, the house started barking at the Buddha. I think then the Buddha said, Brahmin, you haven't done any good deeds in your past and you were born as a dog, now you are going to hell by barking to me, even after being uh, uh, born as a dog. Then the dog, I think, went and some dirty place and hit. Then the son, the, this Todi, uh, he noticed the behavior of the dog and then uh, asked the Buddha why, why he said that about the dog, because he took care of the dog very uh, nicely, like, as if a family member. Thank you. Bhante, about the syntax of one who should be honored, respected, revered, and venerated, who, who is that person? That's one with wisdom and purity. 
should be honored because they practice rightly. You can read about the Sangha, Chupatipano, they practice well. Ujjupatipano, they practice uh, righteously or upright, not crooked. Nyaya Patipano, they practice on the right way. Saminci Patipano, they practice rightly. Yeah, because there are some people who are who feel uncomfortable to uh, show respect to virtuous beings. Even to monks, they don't feel like bowing down or showing any respect, calling by name, just nothing. No, no yeah, I mean, respect the, the, the real answer is the, 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 the eight types of, or the four, let's say the four types of holy people. Someone who is enlightened is really the one who is worthy of respect. There's also other more worldly positions, like your parents are worthy of respect, your teachers are worthy of respect. Not in the same way as an enlightened being, is, and that the Buddha is really talking about here, but there is some some aspect to being arrogant and not paying respect to your parents, not being respectful towards them, or respectful toward your, to your teachers. Even I'm talking about like worldly teachers, teachers in school, not being respectful in general. It's a bad habit and is likely to get you in the same sorts of trouble as being disrespectful towards enlightened beings to a lesser degree. But the same idea, it still, it still gives you a bad personality. There's something noble and honorable, being respectful towards your parents as best you can and respectful towards your teachers as best you can, within reason. It's just a good habit to get into. We're respectful towards senior monks, even though we might not think very highly of the senior monks. We do it uh, for our own sake, our own sense of humility and respect. When somebody goes to heaven because of wholesome mental states, like because cultivating loving kindness, how how do we reconcile this with karma? Because it's a the wholesome mental state is not an action. Well, that's the whole point. Is the Buddha redefined the word karma? That it's not the actual action. It's the state of mind behind it, the action. Or it's just the state of mind in general is already a mental action. Okay, thank you. In uh, paragraph 13, it's again the example of giving food, whatever, but it says to recklesses or Brahmins. So these are the most important ones, I guess. And then, uh, is it important also to give to poor to poor people or I don't know even beggars? And... Yeah, well, he's. I mean, you have to consider the audience first of all. It's meaningful and understandable to the Brahmin as an example of charity. It's considered to be the best charity. I mean, the Buddha as well. It's also there's a sort of a subtle twist here that the Buddha phrasing it in this way. It's, I mean, it's not twist, it's not a It's not a manipulation, but it's a couching it in terms that the Brahmin will understand. Because if you, if pressed, and if, if you were to go into detail, which you wouldn't do for the Brahmin here, you he would say, well, the only true Brahmins and true recklesses are enlightened beings, are the four types of enlightened beings. But you put in, in these terms, and it's also important, or or there's a strength to it, because... He's not saying Buddhists. He's not saying giving to me. He's saying mm -hmm. he's being magnanimous and 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 uh, pointing out that it's not about religion. It's not about this group or that group. When you give to people who are true recklesses, and that was one of the powers of the Buddhist teaching, especially at that time, was his bold claim that, yeah, recklesses and Brahmins are holy, but only true recklesses and true Brahmins, and that. It wasn't about being a good Buddhist. It was about being a good person. And you can be a, a Samana or a Brahmana. Anyone can be those two terms in a real sense if they are noble and pure. Even if you give to an animal, you uh, can have the potential of giving like a hundredfold result in the future. According to Dakin Vivaka Sutta. Well, so another thing you could say is it's it's not really significant in terms of rebirth. It's not really 
significant in the same way as giving such potent gifts to enlightened beings, that sort of thing, or to people who are worthy of respect. I mean, not necessarily even enlightened beings, but people who teach wise things. There, there would have been teachers in the time of the Buddha that weren't Buddhist, but still taught basic good things. Maybe taught karma and uh, taught people good things. And they're, they're worthy of respect, worthy of gifts. They were able to give wise advice in a worldly sense, at least, or even in a spiritual sense, leading to heaven. Possible outside of the Buddha Sasana, such people existed. So, you know, that, that sort of um, charity is quite potent. And it was, it was well known at the time of the Buddha. Of course, that's where the alms round today comes from. Uh, it was it was before the Buddha didn't inst uh, institute this. It was in existence before the Buddha. So there was a sense of a, being a part of life to give to to give alms to recluses and of priests as well. There are even uh, recluses who who had attained uh, the jhana, uh, example Alara Kalama. So yeah. they were like holy people. Yeah. In the list of the uh, things one may give to a recluse or a Brahmin, there are a lot of things, but I do not understand carriages, gar garlands, and scents. It's interesting, isn't it? Um, well, yeah, it wouldn't be suitable for monks, but these were things that were... So carriages, well, Brahmins did have their own carriages. So it's a gift of that's useful for them. I mean, today you see it in monks are given gifts. Buddhist monks are given gifts of cars in North America, and they drive cars. I mean, even monks can be given rides in a carriage if they're sick. In the time of the Buddha, we weren't allowed to ride in a, even a carriage unless we were sick. Uh, scents and scents can be interpreted in two ways. I mean, first of all, they would everyone was wearing scents. So there's Brahmins who are not. Uh, were monks who would be given those as well. But I think uh, probably this is more referring to the reverence. We give, uh, like we put flowers on at their feet and that sort of thing. And you give them it as an offering because it's such a pure and it's symbolic of purity and positive states, a gift that came to signify respect. Yeah, and even if you give it to a lay person, it's uh, like something uh, pleasant for that person. So it is good karma for you. Does that mean that always when you give something, it's good? Again, it's not the act of giving, it's the state of mind. You can't just talk about giving as being good or bad. If you have the mind state, it is going to be beneficial and you don't have greed towards it and you have a kindness towards the recipient, then that is wholesome. I was, um, so, I don't know, I think Sanka was saying how uh, a human rebirth is so special and beneficial and so on. And uh, somehow I just can't see that because um, in, in, in many, many times and many years, right, uh, after... So even now, very few people are actually interested in the Dharma uh, and make use of their human life, I guess. And then after the Dharma is gone, then it's like no, lots of yep. times without any meaning, right? So, I mean, I, I feel like uh, we are overestimating the human yeah, but, birth. Yeah, but no? compare, compare that to an animal birth. You, at least if you're born a human, even if you're not interested in them, you still have the potential to do something good, right? Even, you know, something uh, really bad too. Yeah, of course. But still, uh, compared to being born as an animal, you, even if you are not a Buddhist, you can still do good. It's, it's not a refutation to say you have the power to do a lot of good evil. It's the point is you have power. It's a, it's a special state because of the power that you have. So yes, you can use it for evil. That doesn't make it worse as a as a state of birth. It actually makes it better. It, it points to the power that you have, which is absent for an animal. 
But why we are comparing to the lower state? So let's compare it to the to the heavens. Is it better to be born a, as a human instead of an angel or a devil? Well, it's tricky because angels tend to be negligent. I mean, that's that's some people say it's actually not really held, um, not really supported by the suttas. I mean, there's certain cases like even Saka became quite negligent in up in heaven, but in the Tabatinsa heaven. But there are also stories of angels who were surprised at how negligent humans are themselves were not negligent it can be hard because you have such a long life it's hard to see impermanence hard to see suffering it's hard to see non-self you have such agency and such freedom i think um there's a big difference with heaven before the buddha before buddhism arose and heaven now after buddhism arose because there'll be many buddhists in heaven but also, like, uh, if you are in heaven, uh, your surrounding is really, um, it's not all that possible that you do evil because the people are, uh, or the devas are different. Like, at least they are keeping the five precepts, with, which isn't, uh, tr- yeah. it isn't true that. in the human world. Mm-hmm. But that can be, yeah, that, that, that I would say a good point, but there is also the issue that because it's so pleasant, you become complacent. I mean, I think that's the big issue with having complacency. Not so mm-hmm. much that people do evil or horrible, it's just they don't accomplish much. Whereas in the human realm, there's a sense of urgency because of how unpleasant it can be. Mm-hmm. Not to say that's an argument that human world realm is better. I mean, talk to any Buddhist monk, lay person, they're always talking about how great heaven is. The tradition is that heaven is is desirable. And that's not just because of how pleasant it is. It's it's a preferable state. There's not really a sense that it's better to be human. This is sort of a modern not modern, mm-hmm. but a Western, I guess, or a, a, a What's the word? Not modern. Yeah. Maybe modern is correct because even in Buddhist societies, but heaven is so, always so, uh, appreciated. So when you ask whether it is better, you have to define your criteria. What do you mean by better in terms of understanding the Dhamma or in terms of being a, a more comfortable existence? Because if you're saying, if you're saying, or, or if you're saying that uh, in terms of what causes it, like to be born in heaven generally requires a more potent kusala uh, karma than to be born in the human world. So, in terms, if you if you uh, if, if that is one of your criteria criterion, then you can say yes, heaven is better, much better. And that, there are a lot of uh, things you have to do as a human. I mean, you're trapped in the womb for nine months and you can't do anything until you are like at least. Uh, two, four, two to three years old, even then you have to study really hard and do all these chores. You have to bath, you have to brush your teeth and all those things eat. Uh, it's very uh, tiring. All the years of your life you spend working just to survive. Working meaningless labor oh, sometimes. But like Mante said, uh, uh, it there's a, like a balance between uh, the suffering and comfort in the human world, that it is uh, probably more suitable for spiritual development. I don't think that's really held, that's really supported. I mean, maybe it is. I know there's a lot of talk about that, but I don't see it. I don't, I don't see, see it that either. It's supported. Because there's so much because yes. good said about heaven, and you hear about the devas who become enlightened uh, very quickly when they hear the Buddhist teaching. Even look at the conversations that Devas had with the Buddha, they're quite profound. Clear that there's some high sense of highness. I mean, it's not just a party up in heaven, though it can be a party, but it's a there's a high mindedness to it to Devas. Some of the some of the Deva Sanyutta are very hard for humans to understand even. And the Buddha wanted to teach Abhidhamma in heaven. There's a reason for that. I mean, yeah, it's not clear-cut that one is, quote-unquote, better than the other, but 
One can say there are like very little signs of impermanence in heaven, so it is, it can be tougher to grasp that uh, compared to human life. Well, at least the signs of suffering. Guidance. I mean, the point is you need a Buddha to, to guide you, but angels are quite easy, readily able to understand the Buddha's teaching if they're given the guidance. Apparently, I mean, if you believe it, there's the, I think the suttas and the commentaries are quite clear about how quick and easy and how many, how numerous are the enlightenments of devas when they hear the Buddhist teaching. Thousands of them just from hearing the Buddhist teaching will become enlightened. Exactly what Bhante was saying. I mean, I'm I, I'm yet to hear uh, a good reason that I should believe that uh, the human word is better. Uh, to understand the I had one of my students actually follow up with this and really argue with me and ex express concern over my 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 belief that heaven was better. I was quoting uh, Lumpo Chodok, who said that he said, "Don't be born a human. Be born in heaven because that's where that's where Anattapindaka is. Exactly. That's where Saka is. Don't come back as a human." And he's a, this is a Vipassana teacher who's a real scholar, so he knows his his stuff. And it really made me think and appreciate. I mean, and and really hear what was so prevalent in Buddhist Buddhist cultures, talking about the greatness of heaven and how and wishing when people are, are charitable and kind, and that even when people came to practice meditation, it was always, "May you be born in a good place." May you, and Ajahn Tong would always say, he said, oh, you just, just when people repeated, just learning the four Satipatthana, he said, okay, repeat after me. And he teaches the four Satipatthana. He said, okay, you don't even know what these mean. But, but even, even that is enough to, to send you to heaven, to make you be reborn in heaven. And that's, he says that that's a good thing. Now, he, he's not saying how it's, it's an inferior thing and not, not pointing out the important reality that it's not the goal. But it's still something to encourage people. It's not. It's not like, oh no, I shouldn't have done that because now I'm going to go to heaven and I'm better off as a human being. There's never any sense that that's the case. It's always, oh, that, that could lead you to heaven. That's a good thing. And this is meditation teachers saying this. In some ways, it's a bit of a cookie or a carrot. When you tell people, oh, this could lead you to heaven, it makes them want to do it. Simple people, you know, people who don't yet have a deeper understanding of the true goal. So there is that, that people will explain as a reason for it, but still doesn't, there's no sense that heaven is bad. I guess what you could say is it's not something you should strive for. It's not, shouldn't be your fix, fix in your focus. The Buddha did say, it's pointed as a criticism. If people practice the Dhamma for the purpose of going to heaven, that's a, that's a bad reason. It puts your mind in the wrong place if you're, focused on heaven but i don't think uh, there's any good in dismissing heaven or discounting it or referring the human realm to the heavenly realm. as sanka says i mean all the trouble that you have how to do as a human how 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 easy is it, how hard is it then to actually have time even to practice the Buddhist oh. teaching yeah, true. But one argument would be Bhante that only humans can ordain as monks. That doesn't really have any need. Yeah, it's and it's not that reality. important. What would that even be like? Uh, isn't ordain Ordin being ordained and I mean, ordination is also very just important. a concept? Ordination is yes, very valuable. Benefit. And and you could argue that in some ways it, it makes you more like Devas. Ordination is for the purpose of, in in some way, making you more like devas in mm -hmm. a way that's important. Because why devas? Devas have stable society. Uh, they have the stability and the freedom is most important. The freedom and the the time and the dedication that they can put into things like meditation. They don't have to. They don't have to go out and engage in the world. They aren't bothered by. Unnecessarily, I mean, they don't have to be bothered by such trivialities, and so that's a big part of what monkhood is about: being uh, not bothered by trivialities, by worldly affairs. 
Oh, more like Brahmas because angels do have female interactions. So just compare, compare, uh, you know, your neighborhood, your neighbors, the, all the people that you know, that you are surrounded with and you have to interact with, to like, if that was like a group of angels in, in a heavenly realm, would, would they have similar attitudes, similar thoughts, similar? No. I mean, it would be so much easier to just, to just be. Yeah, but this is the thing. When you are born as an angel, you get your palace, you get your nymphs, and they entertain you. You are not bothered to go look for the... You getting nymphs is, I think, a bit of a artistic license. Oh. What does that even mean? There are certain, you know, based on human life interactions, there are cases where there's a setup like that. But uh, I would say it's a little bit, something is lost in the translation a little bit. Yeah, uh, Adam Punadama actually writes in his uh, studies about the realms, these uh, heavenly realms that in the... In, already in the 33 uh, God, uh, they were Saka's realm. So it's, there is all, already no uh, sexual inter interaction, like uh, intercourse. And even higher, it's just there only is, like holding hands. Is, and then, yeah, different so forms. I mean, you, sh you shouldn't generalize on cards. For example, where the Bodhisattva yeah. is right now, uh, uh, you know, there is no sexual anything. Well, uh, what if you are born with uh, Mara, Mara and his uh, retinue at the highest level of angel realms? But you don't, you're not, I mean, that's also very confusing. I mean, there is Mara and the retinue is in the lower realm, right? The retina is not, you know, an, they are not angels. No, Mara is at the highest, uh, highest heaven, but, below the Brahma, um, first Brahma. Yeah, but it doesn't mean that the beings that and, are in the heaven see, are Mara's uh, his retinue. Daughters came to, his daughters came to seduce the Buddha, so you can understand what, how they are. That's just, that's just one being there. Paranamita Vasavati. No, not just one being. Mara is the leader of that faction, which means there are many. So, Bhante, you said that your teacher said, uh, mentioned about that uh, while wishing of being, uh, one may be born in a good place. But good place may mean something different than a heaven. I mean, good when we compare good place can be a human uh, being born well, as a human. Use use explicit terms like suwan. Suwan is the word. Suwan is the word they use. Suwana is heaven. Pretty explicit. Um, There's no sense that heaven is clear sense that heaven is a good place. Because I, I, I know a story, I don't know if it's true, that even in heaven, I mean, you can, it, it can happen that they won't interact with the Dharma. And they, uh, like, the, at the end of the life, although they have a very, very long life, they can be so angry by the fact that they die that they can get into the hell. Yeah, but none of that speaks to whether it's better or worse. Those are just possibilities. Of course, it, no one is making the claim that heaven is somehow free from those possibilities. It's not enough, obviously. The question of whether it's preferable, I, mean, I don't think it's just something we should really dwell upon. It's not uh, obviously really all that important, but I, I, it is still worth remarking and pointing out that you shouldn't shy away from it or discard the importance of uh, good good deeds in general. Something you should accept that as a part of 
your path, you'll probably wind up in heaven at some point if you're dedicated. It's probably what will happen if you continue to practice mindfulness. Your mind is too, too pure for the human realm. And that's a good thing. It's not something you should be concerned about. You should be a little bit concerned if you end up there without any real depth of knowledge because you can become complacent in heaven. There's a danger there. But I mean, it's the same danger with any thing. It's not to say that they're not good things, like wealth is not a good thing or so on. They're just powerful. And power with power comes well, responsibility, I guess. If if you are already inclined towards meditation and the Buddhist teaching, you won't forget anything if you are reborn in a in a mm -hmm. heaven. And a human, I mean, I don't. Everything. Yeah, I don't see any any downside actually. Well, the complacency is what people usually point to, because it's so pleasant. It's uh, something beyond what you're used to and. Human realm, you've got things to check you. You've got reminders about old age, sickness, and death. There's not a lot of that in heaven. So it's possible to mm -hmm. become complacent. That's usually the sorts of things people say. And it's fair. I think it's true, but just something, just this cause for care. And it shows you that it's not the most important. It's not what we should be focused on. We should not be focused on, am I going to go to heaven? That's a dangerous fixation because it's that sort of fixation that will cause real problems. Um, Bante, uh, on the topic of wealth, um, I hope you could maybe comment. Um, ordinarily, I guess with my upbringing, um, you sort of taught that wealth, that uh, sort of main cause of wealth is developing a skill and you know, dedicated hard work. Um, whereas this is a bit of a shift. Um, generosity is not necessarily um, sort of linked to the direct cause of wealth. Yeah, this is, um, I was going to comment on this earlier, actually, because this is um, a, a cause for doubt about karma in general. When you think of what actually brings about results, it's usually um, hard work or effort, and it can even be unwholesome effort. If you rob a bank successfully, or if you uh, steal in general, I mean, on the balance sheet, you're up, you've benefited. So what you have to understand is the power that um, allows you to do these things, and power is of many types, but generally, this is why I mentioned a couple of times already about heaven is powerful, the wealth and high society. These are power. Even being a, born a human being, as we mentioned, is something that gives you the power. And the power can be used for good or evil, but it's empowering. And that's really the importance of karma and why you can argue that good karma or good deeds, goodness in general, is very important to Buddhists. Because if you have the right frame of mind, that power is going to allow you to implement. If you have bad karma, even though you have good intentions, when are you going to find time to meditate? You're poor, you're uninfluential, you have no friends, your 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 family is your family life is all messed up. Even if you are a good person, it puts a lot of obstacles in your way and you end up wasting a lot of time doing things that if you had more power. You could do it, you could use better. So it, it, at, it at the same time points to the limitations of karma, the worldly nature of karma, good and evil, uh, as well as pointing out how, yet how important it is for someone who is on a good path to do good karma as a support for your practice. How being reborn in heaven is in some ways the best thing that can happen to someone who is dedicated to the Dhamma because of the freedom and the power it gives you. And because of all the examples you see of how powerful and how quick to become enlightened angels they are, but um, it of in and of itself is not of any value. It's just valuable as a tool for someone with the right uh, inclination. 
someone with the wrong inclination can use the power for bad, like Mara even. Some devas use power for for bad purposes. So was that did I answer your question? What was the question exactly? About wealth? Um yeah, I think you definitely well, right. touched wealth, on it. Um wealth wealth so with wealth wealth comes from hard work but your ability to do the work and many of the connections you have your capacity your mental capacity all of that allows you to become wealthy um what it's talking about here in this sutta is something a little bit more uh inherent like being born into a rich family or having a lot of opportunities having mysterious connections that just magically sort of allow you to be rich and to be wealthy in that sort of position. I mean, it's, again, yeah. very complicated, but there's a general sense that if you were generous in a past life, you'll have some really remarkable opportunities in this life. One more thing is, again, it's about the potential, like the power that you have to 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 work, and karma gives you that. Good karma gives you potential mm -hmm. which you can then use for good for evil for worldly pursuits for spiritual pursuits yeah um, often I, I used to read a lot of books by sort of autobiographies by wealthy people like um like the person who created nike etc and it was always sort of unfulfilling like i never really saw and it was it was always like you'd say um, then I went to the bank manager and he gave me a loan where it didn't, it doesn't seem, uh, my reality was never like that, I guess, <laughs> where it was so easy to get those, um, uh, now then I'd start thinking, oh, maybe it's being Jewish, et cetera, et cetera. But I can, I can sort of see the, uh, um, yeah, see how you could be in positions whereby um, things come a bit easier for you for the same amount of work. Yeah, or or significantly easier. Like, I don't think Bill Gates was anything remarkable as a human being. I mean, I think he is fairly remarkable. That's not fair. He is fairly remarkable, but not in the way that, not in like uh, being smart or it was more about. Um, First of all, being in the right place at the right time, but also I think he has some good qualities to him. Uh, but nothing, nothing special. I don't think as a business person. I mean, not not exceptionally so. Not like Einstein levels of brilliance or something like that. And then you look at Einstein, and I don't know, he wasn't that rich, was he? No. And yet he had some remarkable things about him. Like Mark Zuckerberg yeah. is certainly not the, the best example of someone who of how to make a million or billions of dollars it's just kind of in some ways yeah as you say i mean you have better examples than me i'm sure about how it just seems like things worked for them in ways that they wouldn't work for someone else and often Hearing Warren Buffett speak, he often admits that like it's mostly a lottery, the fact that he is so wealthy, given that sort of the way he was brought up with his parents, friends, and sort of just how he was able to gain knowledge, um, which, which he was already adept at implementing from his parents, friends, etc., etc., yeah, on the one hand, uh, it, it opens an interesting line of conversation about the importance of providing opportunities, about equality. And on the one hand, we it, there's a mistake that is often made when people rage against the inequality of the world and get angry. But it's not to be dismissed, oh, that's just their good karma and they deserve it because of the good things they've done. You have to be able to separate the past and the present. and rich people who hoard wealth are doing a very bad thing and there's no nobility or rightness to that when you have wealth the best thing you can do is give it all away or most of it anyway but uh, another part of the conversation i think has to do with the sort of missing the point 
about trying to give people opportunities. And this is, of course, why the Buddha did no such thing. It was more about reminding people of what gives you those opportunities. It's not rich people handing money or influential people handing influential people handling handing you opportunities. It's about uh, the goodness that you do that gives you the power to create those opportunities for yourself. And the reason, big reason why we don't have those opportunities is just worldly karma. Also, other other factors contribute as well. For example, if you are born beautiful, even if you are born to a poor family, you can get favors, get things done, or maybe somebody rich will marry you, something like that. Beauty is a power of a sorts. Beauty can also be a curse. Beauty is not, I mean, it's karma is complicated. But yes, thank you. Appreciate it, Mata. Lots of these things are, give you opportunities and power. There's You hear about people who are, are un, uh, unremarkable or, or overweight people who are just ignored, uh, passed over, treated with contempt. It has nothing to do with their personality necessarily. I mean, the Buddha said in the end, Yoda punyancha papancha bahitva brahmacharyava, one who has expelled good and evil or discarded it, has no more use for it. That's a person who is a true bhikkhu. Some people mis- misinterpret it as, uh, okay, we don't need to do anything bad, but we also don't need to do anything good either. Well, it's, I mean, it's kind of true that in the end you don't. It, it doesn't mean that you don't do good, but you don't have to anymore. That's really the point. Uh, the, the, yeah, the, it's a profound sort of teaching that's easily misunderstood by taking it on a too superficial level. It means that uh, someone has gone to something greater than that and has seen good is not actually the point. The point is not to do good. I think good is best seen as sort of a support, a catalyst, uh, something that gives you the power to work towards the ultimate goal, the ultimate good, which freedom or release, peace. Dante, uh, in paragraph uh, 17 and uh, 18, it's about uh, how one... uh, what leads to stupidity or wisdom. So uh, I was just thinking like um, this, it, it only mentions again, recklessness or Brahmins, but I don't, I mean, there has to be a wider, wider list, right? The, from who you inquire knowledge. Well, not really. I mean, first of all, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have occurred to this Brahmin to go to anyone but a, a reckless or Brahmin for wisdom, generally speaking. Generally speaking. And second of all, anybody who's worth going to in the first place is worthy of this title of a Brahmin or a Samana, no matter who they are. So again, I mean, you don't, don't take this literally or anything. Mm-hmm. You don't have too narrow a reading of it someone who helps you with uh, spiritual progress is uh, comes under that group yeah it's still it's still the um, uh, what i'm seeing is that many people do come let's say to you bante and uh, they actually don't ask anything ever so, I mean, it, it, this enumeration to me, it seemed like, oh, this is pretty dangerous then. Like, if if people are shy and so on, like, they not ask questions. It means they are not interested in the Dhamma. They are not discussing the Dhamma. They are not, they are not trying to understand the Dhamma. They are not uh, they, learning they what might is going they might be that, but I'm hearing people who are like anxious around, let's say, Bante, or you know, they they are not comfortable asking questions. Oh, you are talking about a specific. It's okay. I guess they have to overcome that uh, uh, shyness. Yes. Um, yeah, I was commenting 
sort of shortly um, visiting uh, a wise person in our modern day could also just mean sort of logging onto YouTube and you know sort of following um, their comments and their views. Yeah, that means you are following somebody's uh, teachings. I mean, you don't have to uh, stand in front of the person to learn. I mean, not always, but it would be better to get that advice in person, but you still can follow somebody's teaching. All right, I have to go, everyone. Have a good week. Sadhu. Thank you, Thank you good week, everyone. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu.